Well, thank you everybody for having us. Um, thank you, Eleni and the whole team from the University of Aegean for putting this together. And um, I think we find it very productive in the sense that um, it's also a meeting that brings together different disciplines and different language regions. Um, and um, for us as non-native speakers of English, uh, it's also a pleasure to present in a context where English is not spoken natively. Um, this is a paper that unfortunately has already been published, and unfortunately in the sense that we wanted to present something new, um, but the reason why we didn't manage to is 80 centimeters tall is sleeping peacefully um, back there for now, and we hope that she'll continue to sleep for another 20 minutes. The starting point for this paper is um, an observation that um, we made, the fact that the philosophies of Deleuze Latour, uh, assemblage thinking and actor network theory as the main ideas, actually exhibit many similarities. Um, they have a relational view of the world where action rises from linking initially disparate elements, a topological view of space where distance is the function um, of the intensity of the relation, and they have an idea of the sociomaterial or heterogeneous nature of relations. And in fact, some scholars acknowledge this overlap between assemblage thinking and actor network theory. John Law, for example, one of the key proponents of actor network theory, writes there's a difference between Deleuze's entrancement, obviously translated as assemblage in English, and the term actor network. So there's one side that's quite promiscuous in mixing the terms and does not see a big difference between them. But there's also another debate, a debate that's um, certainly been more prominent in geography, which over the past five to ten years increasingly emphasized the differences between the two concepts. Deleuze and Latour more as antagonists um, than as allies. Um, Nigel Thrift, for example, um, writes in his book on non-representational theory, there is a sense in which AT is much more able to describe stealing accumulation than lightning strikes, the same longings and strategies rather than the sharp movements that may also kiss our dreams. It's an uh, idea that action network theory is more focused on the actual rather than on virtual. Um, Deleuze has interested more in potentiality, not just in the properties of entities, but also in their capacities. I think that's what Manuel Villando also highlighted as one of the key characteristics of assemblage, the exteriority of relations. That Actor network theory here, according to Thrift, doesn't seem to be able to deal with as well. So this is where the, our paper intervenes. It intervenes in two ways. Uh, conceptually, by analyzing the conjunctures and disjunctures, and the cross-fertilizations between sandwich thinking and actor network theory. And empirically, by also showing what difference it makes when one applies actor network theory, assemblage thinking, or both, to empirical research. And um, we will do this and structure the paper in three key dimensions of analysis, asking what actual network theory and assemblage thinking bring to each of these three dimensions. The first one is standardization, which is a key moment in any kind of analysis. The second one is change, so kind of the alter ego to standardization. And the third one is affect. So to start with standardization, um, Stabilization is where a crucial difference emerges between actor network theory and assemblage thinking. Um, and that has to do with the fact that assemblage thinking is um, more a philosophical perspective than actor network theory. It has a sort of limited apparatus of flanking concepts that can be used to describe um, or, um, or capture empirical phenomena. Um, it is highly abstract and it does need further translations, um, as we've seen. I think this is something that distinguishes it from actual network theory, uh, which has a radical commitment to empiricism um, and provides an elaborate apparatus of um, the de uh, to detail the work of stabilizing relations. Now, whether that is um, the, the classic uh, one of the center of calculation that um, Latour have detailed in science and action, whether that's the oligopticon, whether that's the idea of translation or the immutable mobiles. And it comes, and that's a pin for geographers, with a much clearer idea of, um, the, of theorizing 
distance in space and how they are transversed or folded. And I think that makes adaptive theory uh, more easily spatial or it's more easily spatialized uh, than assemblage theory. In a recent interview, Bruno Latour also pinpointed this key difference of the empirical orientation of ANT as a point of distinction um, with Deleuze. He said, when asked, Deleuze also seems to be important, do you still read him? Deleuze is more metaphysics, and the anthropology project that Latour is engaged in is much more empirically based. It's a mixture of philosophy and anthropology. So this is where Latour himself would draw the line between the Deleuzean project and his own project. Yeah, this is also where we start from, because we both not only work on a theoretical level, but both do empirical work, and we're really interested to see through these differences and contractions of actor network theory and sample theory, also through our empirical work. And uh, my empirical work looks at the new field of assisted reproduction and how new global markets of assisted reproduction emerge. So, in my research, I've been interested to understand how a production, which is something very intimate, which normally takes place uh, in the uh, space of our homes, has become a global issue and how transnational networks of surrogacy and assisted reproduction are stabilized across transnational space. And the surrogacy agency is the one you see here, which is called New Life, invest a lot of work in stabilizing their global networks, business networks. So they are one of the key players who are kind of pushing this market towards especially countries in the global south um, and expanding their networks in order to kind of um, um, meet the increasing demand for assisted reproduction and surrogacy abroad. So they have to make a constant effort to stabilize their business networks in the sense that they need to uh, coordinate different actors, for example, the menstrual cycle of egg donors and surrogate mothers with the one of the clients and intended parents, to expand their business networks and always find kind of new niches where they can kind of open up their businesses and where surrogacy is either not regulated or legal, and then also find new actors into their networks in the sense that they find new agencies that help them to recruit surrogate mothers and actors. And I find uh, actor network theory as a very helpful toolbox to think about these processes of stabilization in this market. So we could think about new life as of this surrogacy agency as an oligopticon in Latour's sense as a center of coordination with a sturdy but extremely narrow view of the connected whole, in this case the global surrogacy business. These agencies managed to govern at a distance with the help uh, of some friends, as the CEO of the surrogacy agency explained in an interview, which said, you really need to control the whole process of the surrogacy journey because it is a complicated process. Every country manager, that in its different branches in each country, sends me a full report every week. How many clients have been contacted? How long have they been talked? Name of surrogate donors, their status of preparing for the cycle, and in relation if they're good donors or surrogates, any trouble. You know, all that kind of information, then a weekly financial report, incomes, expenditures, it's all on my laptop, every single report. So I think we could understand here in your life the surrogacy agency as an example of how an oligarchy gaze is established across transnational space. And providing devices, um, as a term also used by Colon, uh, such as the weekly report or the management report, kind of all of the interaction between the head office in Georgia and the diverse country offices in these many countries. These relations at the same time are rendered as a metrical as all the right Continue. As all the writing, as all the writings are brought together in one single place. In the case of the CEO's uh, mobile computer. So by doing so, uh, the agency of New Life relies on intermediaries to coordinate its networks, on devices to post to uh, of Kano, uh, for that, for transport meaning or force the sound transformation. So what I'm saying in the A&T inspired view or description here really helps to do is to give us tools to think about how processes of stabilization take place across transnational space. So A&T is strong. A&T is 
strong at looking at stabilization, but what about its capacities to deal with change? Contra thrift, Latour does have a very clear notion of the event of the virtual. Um, Latour, in one of his writings, said the following There are events I never act. I'm always slightly surprised by what I do, by the chance to mutate, to change, and to bifurcate. So, if Latour and his fellow academic theory thinkers have been cast as actualists, um, we think that that is partly also due to the particular reading that Latour has certainly experienced in geography. A reading that's selected in two ways, we would argue. First, by focusing on the early Latour, um, what received much attention in geography was science and action, for example, where the idea of the center of calculation comes from. And not, for example, some later Latour, um, the Paris Ville Invisible Latour, um, Paris the Invisible City, um, that makes uh, um, much more out of uh, the imminent and the virtual. And the second selective misreading is by focusing on the tour, who is probably the most actualist of the AT theorists, in comparison, say, to others like Anne-Marie Moore and John Law. So if you read someone like John Law, um, you see uh, the virtual much more reflected, actually, in the writings. John Law says the following, our fairness is overwhelming excessive, energetic, except undecided potentialities, and ultimately undecided flux. But I think the word of the use flux also gives away how gives away how AT tends to deal with change. It's not abrupt change, it's not the lightning strikes that thrift used in this powerful metaphor, but it's more fluidity, it's gradual transformation. Um, and um, th th this is a very different way from how Deleuze and Assemblage tends to think about events as more something breaking or rupturing. So, we think that um, Latour and Deleuze, Acton Network Theory and Assemblage Theory are actually much closer to each other in when it comes to theorizing change than has commonly been admitted, but there, that there remain still some key differences. And I think we can think about this key differences against through our empirical work on global surrogacy markets in the sense that these agencies are constantly confronted with change in the sense that um, every single year there's new legislation and many countries in the recent years have prohibited surrogacy so the agencies also need to look kind of for new destinations where they can offer their reproductive services. And New Life has one of, been one of the agencies that have been very successful in adopting to the constant legal landscape, a changing legal landscape, and kind of continuing its business and expanding its network, despite the fact that surrogacy has been shut down in kind of the main destinations such as India, Thailand, um, and Mexico. And this thing again, AMT's toolbox helps us here to understand how uh, the agency of New Life kind of manages its network in a fluid way in order to secure its function without disruption. And the actor, kind of the final commodity of the baby, is kept stable by keeping the network relations always fluid. And this again becomes clear in the following quote here, where this year of, a, of, a, uh, uh, of New Life says, we are able to move into a new country in no time because we have a system. We have the template for the homepage, the contract ready, but doing business in different countries isn't always easy. In Mexico, for example, we had to raise the monthly pension for the surrogate mothers because cost of living are higher than in East Europe or India. So we can see that on the one hand, we have what the two would call intermediaries that make the expansion of the network possible. The template of the homepage or the contract is always kind of just uh, translated into different languages. Uh, but network fluidity is crucial to hold relations stable, such as the adoption of the compensation for single mothers. But I would like to argue that not just the fluidity that characterizes this global network, but also the virtual intrudes at, intrudes at every instance in a new life's baby business. Given the unpredictability of the biological process and the often unexpected and fast happening legal changes. And I think the quote of an IVF doctor sums up the eventfulness of this market quite well when he says, 
It's very difficult for you to imagine me running and fighting in a war. But that was my life 20 years ago, uh, so the war in Georgia. This life experience of being in a war also helps in business because you're really trained to improvise. I'm always prepared for problems. For example, in the clinic we have water heating by gas, by electricity, by solar, and once it was winter and nothing worked, we even had firewood. So I think the analogy between war and assisted production is quite revealing here. Wars are probably the most eventful situation in human lives, where the virtual unleashes all its forces and unpredictability. Improvisation that the doctor talks about here is one way of responding to these kind of unforeseen events. The doctor's preparedness shows how the virtual bears on the actual, how the potential future bears on what is present by necessitating precautions. So I think a t is helpful here to conceptualize network fluidity, the changing of shape of networks without disruption, as it occurs in real life's network. Assembled thinking, in contrast, I think is key to think about the eventfulness of this market, the unexpected, the ruptures, and the absent presences of the virtual. So we've seen that on the issue of change, actually network theory and assembled thinking are closer to each other, um, than is sometimes admitted and conceded. But there remains at least one key difference between the two approaches in our view. The difference is that AT stops short of conceptualizing the capacities of bodies, both human and non-human, to affect and to be affected. And that brings us to the last aspect we have to um, touch on, affect. Assemblage theorizes the excessiveness, excessiveness of more than human bodies in a very direct way. Um, if we um, look at what Deleuze and Guattari um, say about the assemblage and its relation to desire. Assemblages are passional, they are compositions of desire. The rationality, the efficiency of an assemblage does not exist without the passions the assemblage brings into play, without the desires that constitute it as much as it constitutes them. I think there are two important moments in that quote. One is that the moment of desire in the original desire. I think the desire of the French term removes it a little from this um, connotation of sexual desire and places this more closer to the semantic field of the wish. The desire, I desire as a wish, an orientation towards something. And the second part is this recursiveness here. So the desires constitute the assemblage, but then they're not the original driving force because the assemblage also constitutes them. So this, in two key ways, is more useful and, I think, more productive than active network theorizing. Um, first, it opens the door to the theorization of the power to affect and, uh, and be affected. And the second is that it counters what has been called the dead pen sense of happenstance in active network theory. One of the key criticisms of active network theory, the question that active network theory has no explanation of why relations or networks merge in a certain way and not in others. And again, we have an illustration from the service market as an effective market where we can see how this desire or wish works out in everyday life. So, effects, we would argue, are key to bind actors in the assemblage of the global service. And we can see this very strongly here in the picture where the desire and the wish for a baby is brought forward uh, in the marketing. But it's not just the effect of marketing that plays out here, but really the desire and wish of the people to kind of have this happy family life. And this becomes clear in the quote again of the doctor who says, The desire in Spanish deseo for a baby is so strong, it always astonishes me what capacities this longing unfolds. What the intended parents manage to move. They organize themselves, they ask friends and family for support, they do all this research to come here to a foreign country. They trust professionals like us and they emotionally support the surrogate mothers throughout the process so that the surrogate in the end is convinced that it was the right thing to do. I think it's important here that we do not conflate the doctor's understanding of desire with Deleuze and Guattari's concept of desire wish. For the doctor, the desire originates in two individuals, the parents, and we focus on one object, the baby. In Deleuze and Guattari's desiring machine, however, Desire wish is always distributed um, and rather links, 
in the, in the wish of the baby. So it's a manifold way, manifold capacities between human and non-human actors that also involve effective power of money, the ultrasound, or the heteronormative idea of happy family life. So I think these desire wishes need to come together for the global assisted reproduction assemblage to emerge in the first place. So desire wish does not emerge as a result of assemblage, as a and perhaps would frame it, but emerges with and in the process of assembly. So we can think about desire wish as active co-constituent of assemblages. So to conclude, I think what we've tried to demonstrate in our paper that neither of the two predominant approaches to thinking act network theory and assemblage thinking are very productive. One approach tries to subsume one and the other and really makes them rather similar. The other tries to keep them apart and emphasize the differences. We are arguing for a careful synthesis in these three respects. In standardization, where act network theory is more amenable to the empirical project of analyzing assemblages and stabilizing relations across space. In the issue of change, where the two approaches have different resources for, stable, for analyzing change as either fluid or as eventful change. And with regard to affect, in particular the role of desire, desire as a force in constituting assemblages, which compensates for AT's blind spots in that regard. So if we want to conclude then, we would probably encourage um, uh, a more careful synthesis and, a, and for a careful project certainly looking into both assemblage thinking and active network theory for theorizing different aspects of empirical problems. Thank you very much.